Hey everyone, Fintech here, and welcome to the Crypto Investing for Beginners tutorial. In this video, I'm going to go over everything you need to know to get started investing in cryptos. Now, this is a rapidly developing area, so the goal of this video is to dump as much useful information as possible. Now, in this video, we'll cover everything from talking about stocks versus cryptos, how to get started buying cryptos, what different types of blockchains there are, and get into topics such as NFTs, staking, and DAOs, or Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. Now, even if you've never heard any of those terms, we're going Going to go over them step by step so by the end of this video you should know more than probably 90 percent of people online talking about cryptos right now and even if you do already know those terms and you're pretty familiar with cryptos there's probably going to be some useful information that you'll find throughout this presentation as well now this is going to be a pretty long video a lot longer than i usually put on this channel so i would encourage you to treat it almost like a class or an instructional book and maybe get out a piece of paper and a pen and try to write and follow along as you go i find that for me personally when i I take notes, I remember things a little bit better and I get a little bit more value out of what I'm learning. And also feel free to pause or rewind or rewatch sections as necessary. That's the great thing about video. I'm going to be sharing this presentation starting from crypto basics and getting to more advanced concepts as we go. And I picked the particular order that I'm presenting in for a reason, but I also am going to list chapters at the bottom of the video. So if you want, you can skip around. Maybe if you already know about a topic or once you've watched the video, maybe you can skip back and rewatch sections that you want to. And you can also check out the different resources that I'll put in the description of this video. I'm going to reference several different exchanges and reports throughout the video, and I'll make sure to link them all below. So I'm super excited to get you started with investing in crypto. There's a ton of potential out there, and there's also a ton of hype and scams going on at the same time. In fact, I've probably seen more disinformation related to crypto than any other topic that I've seen online, and it's a really easy area to get lost in. My goal is to provide you a solid foundation so that you can kind of inoculate yourself against some of the scams out there and also potentially open your eyes to a lot of the future potential that is going on in this space. Now, I know that a lot of people, at least what I've seen, is that they tend to just kind of want everything handed to them. They don't want to learn how to invest. They'd rather just you tell them what to invest in. But I think that if you can actually understand the fundamental reasons for picking a particular investment, you can A, identify potential future opportunities without anybody else needing to tell you about them. And B, it can help you keep conviction when the price fluctuates. That way you can avoid the problem of buying high and selling low. And just the fact that you're watching this video and you're willing to educate yourself on this topic speaks really well, and this information should hopefully help you and serve you for decades even to come. All right, so a couple quick notes before we get started. First of all, watch for scams in the comments. I can almost guarantee on a video about crypto, there's going to be a bunch of people talking about Mr. Roberts and how they made them a bunch of money. It's all scams. I'm not trying to sell anything here. I'm just trying to provide as much value as possible. Now, also we need to note that I am not a financial advisor. I'm just a guy making videos online, and I'm just giving you my experience with crypto so far and trying to provide sort of a framework that you can build on top of yourself later. Lastly, go ahead and hit the like button if you want, and let's get started. Okay, so this video, I'm not gonna have my usual full screen with motion graphics all over the place. I'm going to use a presentation with me just sitting in the corner. And the reason for that is we're going to present some pretty dense information as we go. And I think that's the best way to present it. Also, if you wanna take notes and follow along, I think this will make it a little bit easier if you wanna take screenshots as we go. All right, so the first question that comes up when people talk about crypto is why they should bother investing it. What value does it have? And why would they invest in crypto versus something like stocks or real estate? Well, the first way that we can kind of talk about the value of crypto is as a store of value. Now, this is used a lot when talking about Bitcoin specifically, where people compare it to gold. Now, if you think about gold as an investment, it doesn't create new value in the same way that a stock or a company does, and you can't live in it in the same way that you can with real estate. It simply holds value because people put money into it as a store of value, and therefore it kind of acts as a hedge against inflation over time. Now, obviously the big question there is, does Bitcoin really maintain its value? After all, it is extremely volatile. But while we've seen Bitcoin have huge swings in value at different points in time, those swings are slowly decreasing in magnitude over time. Basically, as Bitcoin becomes a larger and larger thing, its volatility is also decreasing. Now, this might not make it a great hedge against inflation in a short-term context, where the value could easily drop by 30% over a couple of weeks, but over a long time horizon, as the price tends to stabilize, it could act as a hedge against inflation, especially versus holding your money in, say, US dollars. Now, while the store of value and hedge against inflation arguments are often applied to Bitcoin, they don't apply in quite the same way to other cryptos, like, say, Ethereum or Dogecoin, but we'll talk about those a little bit later. 
So really the big benefit of investing in cryptos versus say stocks or real estate isn't as a replacement for those other investments, but instead as a way to diversify your assets across one additional asset class, basically to decorrelate the prices of say a cryptocurrency and stocks and real estate. Now there is a question there in are these things actually decorrelated? You can see in this chart here, the five year performance of Bitcoin, the S&P 500 and US real estate. And you can see that there is some general correlation between all three. So you can see that, for example, the S&P 500 dropped at the same time and they rose at the same time and Bitcoin did the same thing. The big difference is that Bitcoin has been much more volatile over that same period. So while pretty much everything dropped in value at the beginning of 2020, including Bitcoin, the recovery from that has been completely different from different asset classes. But one thing that is interesting to note by just looking at these charts is that while stocks and real estate are very closely correlated and anytime the stock market has dropped, Bitcoin has also dropped, the same isn't true in the reverse. So if Bitcoin drops in price, the stock market does not necessarily do the same thing. So while there is correlation between the price of Bitcoin and stocks, they do somewhat move together. There is also a certain amount of disconnect between those prices. And so that disconnect can help with diversifying away from a pure stock or a pure real estate portfolio. But there's more information we can get than just looking at these charts. So if we look at the average return of Bitcoin on an annual basis, it makes around 94% on average annualized. But when we're talking about crypto investors, no one is actually making that average on a consistent basis unless they invested in Bitcoin way back in the day and never made any trades or changes whatsoever. In fact, if we look at the minimum one year return that Bitcoin returned, so basically its worst year ever, it lost 72% of its value. And if we look at the best year Bitcoin ever had, it gained 303% of its value. So because of the high volatility in cryptos, it's really hard to talk about averages. The fact is while Bitcoin has done well, there are a lot of coins that have gone to zero that people don't talk about. Or there are some coins like Dogecoin, which between January 28th and January 29th in one day grew around 260 16% in value, which is obviously not something you're going to see in the stock market or any other kind of market. And because we see those crazy kinds of swings in crypto, it kind of begs the question of is it investing or is it gambling? And I think the truth is in crypto, you can do both. Now, what distinguishes investing from gambling, in my opinion, is first of all, with investing, you're following a reason-based approach. Basically ask yourself, are there concrete reasons you're investing in a given asset? And if the price of that asset dropped, would those reasons still be true? So your reason for investing can't simply be, well, the price goes up over time, so I guess I'm going to invest in it. There needs to be a reason why you think the price is going to continue to go up over time for you to be putting money into it as a reasonable investor. Gambling, on the other hand, tends to be much more emotionally driven by things like FUD or FOMO. FUD is fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and FOMO is fear of missing out. And this also really ties in with the idea of a crowd mentality. So Dogecoin is a great example of this. Essentially, communities will self-reassure each other that this coin is always going to go up in value, and as it goes, more and more people buy into it, which just increases its momentum over time. And if you're involved in one of these communities, it's really easy to get caught up in the hype and to get kind of swept along and get very emotional about the entire thing. So there's a couple ways you can identify if this is happening. I would say if you're in a community that silences dissent, so basically they claim that any kind of criticism of the price going up is FUD, or anytime they create rallying cries like to the moon or anything like that, that is a red flag. And you want to at least be cautious about that community because they may be being driven entirely based on emotion and not on reason. Now, okay, that's great. You can say that you should be reason driven and not emotionally driven, but how do you actually do that? What are some practical tips to use? Well, one way that you can limit your emotion is only checking the price of an asset on say a monthly basis rather than every single day. So for example, if I personally was checking the prices of a coin every single day and watching when it went up 1% and then down 10% and then up 2% and then down 3%, that's an emotional roller coaster. And that wears you down over time and makes your decisions way less logical. If you instead look at only a monthly basis, it's easier for you to maintain a long-term outlook. And I really think that maintaining that long-term outlook is going to result in better performance of your portfolio over time, which is what we're all after anyway. 
Now, the one exception to that is if you're monitoring a crypto that has some kind of event coming up. So for example, Ethereum right now is considering merging with the Beacon chain, which is supposed to happen in Q1 or Q2 of 2022. And so when that event happens, obviously you're going to want to monitor it to see, did it go well? Is the price going up? Or did everything fall to pieces and the price is going to drop? So that's the one exception to monitoring it only on a monthly basis is if there's some fundamental reason that you should be worried about the price moving dramatically, in which case paying a little bit more attention can make sense. Another way to limit emotional investing is to avoid echo chambers. So in general, investing on social media driven platforms like Twitter or Reddit can be problematic because the algorithms behind that tend to encourage echo chambers. So while those can be excellent resources and there are some people on there who do great due diligence, you need to be careful that you're always seeing both sides of the issue. And then the number three thing I would say to try to limit emotion is just to pause. So if you're planning on making a trade, let's say you wanna buy a bunch of Ethereum, Write that down on a piece of paper, I want to buy X number of Ethereum, and then wait for 24 hours before actually putting in that order. That way during that pause, you can really determine is this something I actually want to do or is this just an impulse in the moment? Now the last thing we need to talk about when talking about investing versus gambling is the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect is where people with limited knowledge tend to overestimate their knowledge. Now the problem with this is it can result in you taking on greater risks than you would otherwise because you think you know all the downsides even though you don't. So really the only solution to this is to always try to stay humble and always assume you could be wrong about any given investment. And also remember that this also applies to other people who appear confident online. But now that we've gotten a lot of the discussion around cryptocurrencies out of the way, let's get to the core issue, which is what is an actual cryptocurrency? Well, a cryptocurrency fundamentally is a digital asset that is decentralized and is cryptographically secure. Now, decentralization is accomplished using a tool known as the blockchain. So you can have a blockchain without also having a cryptocurrency, but you cannot have a cryptocurrency without first having a blockchain that it runs on. Now, there's a great example that we can use to explain the distributed ledger technology behind blockchain. So there was this podcast on Planet Money about a guy named Charlie Shem. And Charlie Shem was arrested for breaking some rules related to Bitcoin trading, and he went to prison. In prison, he realized that the currency that the other prisoners were using was mackerel, like little tin packets of mackerel, which was basically used as currency. Now, the problem was with the mackerel is over time it would expire, or if a bunch of people brought in a bunch of new mackerel from outside the prison system, it would essentially make all the existing mackerel worthless. So it wasn't the best way for them to keep track of money. So what he did was he came up with a thought experiment. What if you had a couple trusted prisoners with notebooks that basically wrote down everybody who had mackerel and how much mackerel they had? Then if there was any kind of trade and someone transferred mackerel to one person or another, every one of those prisoners would write down in their notebook that that transaction occurred. Then on say a monthly basis, all the people with notebooks would meet up and they would check their transaction logs against each other. And if they all matched, everything would be good. And if one of them disagreed, they would adjust his notebook to match everybody else's. In this way, the currency of mackerel is actually run on a decentralized ledger system. In this case, that ledger is just kept on notebooks, but no one person controls it. And it's all secured by the fact that there's multiple people tracking every single transaction. And the blockchain works exactly the same way, except that tracking is all automatic. And there are benefits to using this kind of decentralized technology. First of all, the fact that it's not centralized. So if you had a company, for example, that issued its own currency, if that company goes out of business, that currency disappears. Or if it's run by a country and that country needs to start printing money to pay off debts, you could have runaway inflation and that currency could become completely worthless. Also using cryptographically secure technologies like the blockchain is you know transactions are secure. No one can fake transactions because everybody has a ledger of every single transaction that's ever taken place. But while there are benefits, there's also some negatives to the blockchain. Now, first of all, you might count this as a negative or not, but there's the fact that cryptocurrencies are not currently highly regulated. So at least in the US, most cryptocurrencies are being regulated as a currency rather than a security, which means the rules that apply to them are much more lax than say the stock market. And this is despite the fact that most people obviously buy cryptos as an investment and not as a currency to use. So chances are this rule is gonna change at some point in the future. Another big downside is that while there is a ton of innovation happening in this space, there's also a lot of innovation and scams happening in this space to try to get people to part with their money. 
And lastly, there's always the risk that a lot of change could happen very quickly in this space if new regulations come out that restrict a lot of the activity happening. So for example, if the US started regulating cryptos the same way that China has, we could see a whole shift in this ecosystem basically overnight. But to understand cryptos better, it's good to start with where they came from. So let's look at the past of cryptocurrencies. Now, the first cryptocurrency is obviously Bitcoin, which was created by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009 when he minted block zero on that chain. And the big benefit of Bitcoin was its decentralization. Now for years following 2009, there was no real thought of Bitcoin as an investment. It was really used sort of as a novelty currency. For example, in 2010, one guy used 10,000 Bitcoin to buy a $40 Papa John's pizza which today would be worth $378 million. And the Bitcoin community kind of continued on like that. It was a small but dedicated community until in 2017, the price absolutely blew up. Pretty much overnight, everybody was talking about Bitcoin. Everybody and their cousin was issuing a new ICO or initial coin offering, trying to take advantage of the hype. And in this environment, a ton more people got onto Bitcoin. But at that point, there were too many users, the transactions were way too expensive and way too slow to continue using it as a currency, and it was just really terrible for the environment. Now the thing is, Bitcoin uses something known as proof of work to validate all of its transactions. Now I mentioned earlier that Bitcoin uses a distributed ledger system to keep track of all the transactions on the chain. But what's to prevent someone from just making a whole bunch of computers to write fake transactions all at the same time? enough that they own more than 50% of the computers on the chain and they can basically make up transactions. Well, the way Bitcoin avoided this is using something called proof of work, where essentially to mine new blocks on the chain, you would have to use huge amounts of computing power. This basically meant that no one person could ever have the economic resources to mine enough Bitcoin to compete with everybody else combined. And because no one could ever gain 50% of the computing power behind Bitcoin, it meant the transactions couldn't be faked by an individual. But while this is a good solution to making sure that the transactions are correct, it also results in ridiculous amounts of wasted energy because there's a ton of different people solving every single block, doing basically pointless calculations just for the sake of saying that they can do them. Now, there have been theories put out there to try to solve this ridiculous use of energy like proof of stake, which we will talk about later. But essentially, the success of Bitcoin spawned a million new coins, partly as a result of Bitcoin's success and the desire to get financial success, as well as to try to solve some of the technical issues that existed with Bitcoin. Which leads us into the current state of cryptos today. Right now, Bitcoin is the largest cryptocurrency in the world. In fact, its market cap is just over double the size of the number two crypto, which is Ethereum. Now, Ethereum was launched by Vitalik Buterin and a team of developers, and what it did was actually expand onto the capabilities available with Bitcoin, adding in functionality such as smart contracts and decentralized apps, or dApps. And these enabled new technologies such as NFTs and DAOs, which we'll talk about a little bit later. These new innovations have absolutely exploded in this most recent cycle of renewed interest in cryptocurrencies, and Ethereum has actually beat out Bitcoin in terms of the rise in its price over the last two years. Now, even though Ethereum is introducing a lot of new innovations, there are still some problems with it. Number one, its cost of transactions is still way too high to use as a currency, which is the same problem we've had with Ethereum. And so to deal with that, there's been the advent of these new coins called stable coins. For example, Tether and USDC, which are actually pegged to the US dollar. So these coins are supposedly backed one to one by a US dollar. Now, despite that, there are some questions around how true this actually is, especially for Tether. They claim they have $1 in reserve for every coin that they mint, but there was this great breakdown by CoffeeZilla where he explained some of the somewhat shady practices that were going on at Tether. So there is some question around that. And in addition to these stable coins, we also have altcoins, which is basically everything else. Now an altcoin like Cardano or Polkadot or Solana usually introduces some new technology that neither Bitcoin nor Ethereum already has, or some like Dogecoin exist purely to make money. But many of them do have specialized use cases, and a lot of them introduce new technologies such as to improve the speed of the network, or to add new features or allow running more complex programs on top of the blockchain. So for example, one of the ways they do this is through proof of stake which is a concept that Ethereum's been working on for a while, but plans to launch in full for its blockchain in 2022. 
Proof of stake is a consensus mechanism, just like Bitcoin's proof of work that we talked about earlier. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the goal of consensus mechanisms is to make sure that no one individual or group of individuals can get powerful enough to control 50% or more of the network, which would allow them to fake transactions. Now, Bitcoin did this using computing power, but what Ethereum wants to do is do the same thing by staking the actual ownership in Ethereum. So basically they're betting that no individual would ever own 50% of the Ether tokens, which probably makes sense. This would reduce all the issues with the huge environmental costs of running complex calculations just for the sake of doing work, and it would potentially make the network much more efficient in the future. But again, that isn't actually launched yet on Ethereum, though it has launched on some of these altcoins, which is one of the reasons that they're so popular. But while some altcoins are introducing new innovative technologies, you can't deny the fact that a lot of altcoins are just plain scams. There are a lot of small market cap coins that try to just build up a bunch of hype, get the price to go higher, and then they basically pump and dump it and then sell out everything they have, the price crashes to zero, and you never hear from the developers again. So altcoins, while they do have a lot of potential, are also even more risky than the larger cryptos like Bitcoin and Ethereum. But now let's get into ways that you can actually buy crypto today. Now there's basically two ways that you can hold crypto. You can either do it in a wallet or you can do it with an exchange. Now all crypto in the world is stored in some kind of wallet, which is essentially a public key where people can send you crypto, which acts kind of like an address so they know where it goes, and then a private key, which actually acts like the key that unlocks your wallet. And anyone who owns that key or has access to it effectively owns all of the crypto in that wallet. So it's extremely important that you keep it secret from anyone else. Now, even within wallets, there's different kinds. There are hot wallets and there are cold wallets. Hot wallets are wallets that are actively connected to the internet. So the advantage here is you can trade in and out much more quickly, but there's also some security concerns because you can access it over the internet. On the other hand, you have cold wallets, which are completely air-gapped and disconnected from the internet. There's actually two major kinds of cold wallets. Uh, one is a hardware wallet, which is a physical device, kind of like a flash drive. Or you can use a paper wallet, which is literally writing down your public key and your private key on a piece of paper. That way, no one can ever access it via some kind of internet hack. Now, exchanges, on the other hand, are different from wallets. Exchanges will hold your crypto for you, basically using a wallet of their own that you don't have access to. So they, from a crypto sense, technically control all of your crypto. And you just have to trust the company enough that they're not going to run away with it, which is why some crypto hardcore enthusiasts are not a fan of exchanges. At the same time, exchanges make it even easier than a hot wallet to buy in and out of cryptos very quickly, so they've become extremely popular in recent years. But in terms of wallets you can use, if you want a hardware cold wallet, so completely disconnected from the internet, one you can use is the Ledger Nano X, which is a very popular option. Another option you could use is Coinbase Wallet. Coinbase Wallet is really good for beginners, and it has a mobile app that goes with it that makes it really easy to use. And this is an example of a hot wallet. So it is connected to the internet, but you still own all the crypto inside of it. Aside from that, we also have Exodus, which is a desktop-based wallet. And there's also MetaMask, which is a crypto wallet and can also exchange coins and other tokens for NFTs. And this was designed specifically for the Ethereum ecosystem. And then in addition to all those wallets, you also have the big exchanges. You have Coinbase, which is the largest crypto exchange in the US, and it's really good for US specific customers that even generate your IRS tax documents for you. You have Kraken, which is really good for staking. They have a lot of offers for paying you interest on your actual tokens. You have Gemini, which was actually started by the Winklevoss twins, who you may remember from the Social Network movie, uh, the guys who originally started Facebook before Mark Zuckerberg came into the picture. You have Voyager, which has a really good mobile app and has better staking than Coinbase. And you have Binance.us, which is very full featured, but you need an identity verification to use it. So I keep getting rejected. I actually haven't been able to create a Binance.us account yet. And Binance also offers the ability to loan them crypto in exchange for interest rates that they'll pay you. Basically, you lock up crypto with them and they'll pay you interest for doing so. And we'll talk about that a lot more during the passive investing section of this video. But if you don't live in the US, there's also some good international options. Now, the wallets are essentially the same because decentralization, the whole point is it's not centralized to one country. So there you go, you can use all the same wallets. But in terms of exchanges, there's a little bit of difference. Binance is actually a lot more useful outside the US than inside because there's less regulation and there's different staking rewards. 
In fact, Binance offers over 500 different cryptos that you can buy and sell, while in the US, there's only 53 cryptos that you can use. Coinbase is still a good option outside the US as well as in the US. Crypto.com is a good option outside the US. Now, this one is not available in New York State, and they offer 100 coins internationally, but there's 40 fewer of those available in the US, and an additional 35 of them are only available in some US states. And overall, Crypto.com works better as a bank than an exchange, at least in the US. And then last up, you have Kraken, which also works very well internationally as well as in the US. So, okay, you understand where you can buy cryptos, you kind of understand what the current state of the market is, but how can you actually make money with cryptos? Well, there's a couple different ways you can do it. So let's first just walk through the different options there are for making money, and then in some later slides, we'll dive in more detail to each one. So first up, you have staking, which is essentially where you leave tokens with an exchange or with a specific network, and in exchange, you receive some kind of interest back. Number two is price appreciation, which the value of the coin just goes up. That's probably the one you're most familiar with. You also have mining or validating. So with Bitcoin specifically, this is the reward that you get for doing proof of work and actually mining new blocks. Now mining is very expensive because you have to pay for the electricity to run some kind of mining rig. You usually have to buy some kind of specialized hardware to actually do the mining. And the rewards paid out decrease over time as the network gets bigger and bigger. For Bitcoin mining specifically, there are very specialized rigs that have very different profitabilities you can buy. Right now I'm showing a website which estimates how much money you'd make from each different rig. I probably won't be going into any more detail than that on here since personally I'm not a huge fan of Bitcoin mining and the amount of waste that it produces, but there's a resource you could use. Outside of mining, some other networks that use, for example, proof of stake still use validators, where again, you have to use some kind of specialized hardware and usually need a certain amount of technical knowledge, but then you'll actually validate transactions on the network and get paid for that. And then the last option is essentially minting assets, so creating new NFTs. Now, I made a whole video on doing that myself using Jack Torsey's tweet, which he previously sold for $2.9 million. And there's a ton of hype in the NFT area, starting with when Beeple sold his picture for $69 million. The overly attached girlfriend NFT, for example, sold for, for $411,000 and a whole bunch of different people basically profited off of memes in this space. Now, I'm not saying that you're gonna make that kind of money selling NFTs, but there is the potential to make money there. So basically the rest of this video is going to be focused on these different ways of making money with crypto. So first off, you have staking. Now, all those different exchanges I showed you earlier, one way to determine which one you want to use is based on which one will pay out the highest interest rate for you keeping your tokens with them. So for some people who just want to invest completely passively in cryptos, it's a reasonable strategy to buy a bunch of cryptos, put them in an exchange that will pay out an interest rate, like say Kraken or Voyager, and then just let them sit there and let them slowly accumulate in value over time. But if you're a more active investor, you might care less about the staking rewards and care more about the UI and usability of the exchange, as well as the speed of information that they get to you. Now, when talking about staking, the first thing we need to do is differentiate it from proof of stake. Now, proof of stake is a consensus mechanism that secures the chain by staking your tokens with a validator. And basically the validator uses your tokens to vote for what transactions they think should go through. Now, for the most part, most individuals don't have enough money to act as a validator themselves. So they'll tend to pool a whole bunch of different people's stake together into staking pools and then use that to support a validator. And you could do that by just getting a bunch of your friends together, but the more common way is to go through an exchange. Now, the other weird thing here is that staking can mean slightly different things on different networks, but generally it means leaving a large enough number of a given crypto's tokens with an exchange for them to pay out some kind of return. So for example, to stake Polkadot on Voyager, you'll need 20 tokens staked and then they'll give you 12% back. Similarly, with Solana, you would also need 20% staked, and then they'll pay you out 4 to 5% back on those tokens. And just like in that example there, the amount that you're going to get paid out by each token completely depends on which exchange you're using and which token you're staking with. So let's just use one example here. We'll use a token called Polkadot, which is roughly the 10th largest crypto in the world right now. And we'll just look at the different examples of how much different exchanges will pay out just to give you an example. If there's one specific crypto that you're interested in, you can look up all these numbers for that crypto as well. So there's two basic ways I could stake Polkadot. I could either do it myself by keeping custody of the tokens, or I can give away custody of those tokens to an exchange. 
Now, as we can see right here, Binance will let you lock up your tokens for 30 to 90 days and will pay out between 11.5% and 16.5% for your tokens. The only problem is there's a limited number of tokens you're allowed to put with them and you have to lock those tokens up for a given amount of time in order to get that interest back which for some people might not be a trade they're willing to make. Below that you have Kraken, which is going to pay you out 12% on your tokens on a yearly basis. And then below that we have Voyager, where if you have at least 20 Polkadot with them, they'll also pay you out 12%. And all those are examples where you will lose custody of your tokens once you send it to them. Now, the other option, if you wanna keep custody, is an option like Ledger Live where if you lock the tokens for 28 days, they'll pay out a 13.5% rate, or Polkadot.js, where again, your tokens are locked for at least 28 days, but you'll get 13.5%. The downside here is it's slightly more complicated. There's a little bit more risk because you have to know what you're doing to actually stake these yourselves, and you need at least 40 DOT to stake in either of these situations. Additionally, you have to pick yourself which validator you're going to support. So if you pick a bad validator and they either try to fake a transaction or they go offline, you could be on the hook for the polka dot that disappears and you'll essentially forfeit the amount that you staked. Overall on this list, I would say the easiest option to get started is probably Kraken if you want no effort whatsoever. Obviously the optimal solution would be to stake a certain amount with Binance up to their limit for 90 days and then stake the remaining amount with either Ledger Live or Polkadot.js if you're willing to take on the extra risk and complication involved in doing so. But aside from staking, one of the biggest ways to make money in crypto is through price appreciation. Basically you buy it and then the price goes up. But how can you determine ahead of time which token's price is going to go up? Well, the real way to do that is to find winners and avoid losers. And here are a couple of questions you can ask yourself to determine that a little more easily. First off, you have to remember that most cryptos out there are either scams or will be failed projects in about five years from now. The fact is, it's just way too easy to start a crypto and it's way too easy for a crypto to fail. So you have to go in with the assumption that most cryptos are not going to work out. On the flip side, some will do extremely well. So if you can identify which cryptos those are, you could make a ton of profit. So one of the first questions you should ask yourself when you're evaluating a crypto is do you really understand it? And take in the Dunning and Kruger effect into account while doing this. Do you actually understand it or do you just understand enough to convince yourself that you understand it? Number two, is the crypto a scam? Ask yourself, is this too good to be true? And look to see if there's a ton of hype online. If all you see is positive sentiment around a given crypto, that would actually be a red flag to me. In this case, positive attention can actually be a negative. Number three, why does this crypto exist in the first place? What problem does it fix that would require it to exist in the future? So for example, both Bitcoin and Ethereum have done extremely well. Bitcoin as the original crypto, and Ethereum because it added new features onto Bitcoin, such as the ability to run smart contracts. It exists because the entire NFT marketplace runs on top of it, as well as most DAOs or DAOs, and any kind of dApps or decentralized apps. And then the last question, which kind of ties in with the third one, is will this crypto exist in five years? Try to keep the longest possible view when evaluating these cryptos. If we think back to 2017 and all the different ICOs that were going on and creating new cryptos that had no real value behind them, it's obvious in retrospect that they weren't going to exist five years later. So try to ask yourself now, what five years from now will no longer exist and avoid that completely. But now that you have those general questions, you need to know where you can actually gather information about these cryptos in the first place. So the number one thing to keep in mind is to try to use primary sources whenever possible. Now a primary source would be a website that is at least run by the community. So an example of this would be ethereum.org or polkadot.network or solana.com. These are all websites that are putting out information directly from the community or the developers behind the crypto. And so if you trust those developers at all, you can trust the information that they're putting out. Now, there is the quick caveat there that this is good for legitimate tokens, but if something is a complete scam, obviously their developers are going to put out positive information. So as long as you're confident it's not a scam, this could be a good option. Now, after that, you can look into white papers. Now, white papers are generally issued when a new blockchain network is created. And you would be surprised that a lot of these white papers are actually pretty readable. Now there are certain parts of it that can get pretty complicated and technical and if you don't have a strong computer science or mathematics background, it might go over your head and that's fine. In that case, another option you can do is look up white paper breakdowns. 
There are people who make videos on YouTube breaking down what a white paper actually says. You can find articles online that explain white papers in words that are easier for you to understand. But it's important for you to know what is in that white paper because that white paper represents what the network actually is, what their goals are, and what it's going to look like in the future. And then outside of those two sources, there's a couple other websites where you can find pretty good information. One of them is Coindesk.com, which is the closest thing I've seen to kind of classic journalism in crypto. They cite a lot of sources, they link to a lot of external websites, and they're pretty good about being factual and not being overly hypey or overly pessimistic about any of their stories. Number two is Crypto Slate, which also has really good articles, although they tend to slant a little bullish on crypto in general. But I mean, that makes sense. That's just the author's perspective. So the information there I have found is pretty good. Number three is Discord. Now, a lot of crypto news is disseminated through Discord right now. A lot of it in private or a mix of private and public Discord channels. So if you really want super up-to-date news, there is a lot of information in those channels, but fair warning, once you join a single Discord channel for a crypto, there are pretty much gonna be a bunch of bots that are going to go through and spam you with new channels to join for a bunch of scams. So if you're going to look into this, maybe create a separate Discord account and try to avoid getting sucked into the black hole of scams and the murky underworld of Discord crypto. And then the last source that I use for all kinds of tokenomics is coinmarketcap.com. Now, coinmarketcap.com is going to give you things like how large the market cap is, what the current price is, what the volume trading is, and I found the information there is pretty good. But speaking of coinmarketcap, the real reason you need those numbers in the first place is tokenomics. Now, tokenomics is essentially the economics of how tokens behave. And I know it's a bit of a cringy name, but that's what people actually call it in the community. Now, there's a few key ideas that you need to understand in tokenomics in order to understand what people are talking about with cryptos. Now, the first concept is market cap, which is analogous to stocks. And yet in cryptos, people can still get confused here. So we're gonna go through this slowly. And this might be a section where it'll be good to go back and rewatch sections or write down notes as we go. So first off, we're going to use coinmarketcap.com for all of this. So in order to calculate market cap, you can take the price of the current coin and multiply it by the circulating supply, which is the number of tokens currently circulating in the public's hands. Now, some people will calculate market cap using the total supply, but this is a slightly different calculation than the one we just did. Now, total supply represents all of the tokens available for a given crypto in existence. Now, the problem with that is it also includes coins that are either reserved or locked in some way, i.e. Polkadot, for example, lets you lock up your tokens for two years in order to vote for new features to add to the network which means those tokens aren't really in the supply anymore and they're not trading back and forth between different people. In addition to that, you can also calculate the fully diluted market cap, which is the max total possible supply of the tokens multiplied by the price. So for example, with Bitcoin, we know that in total, there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin in existence. Right now, we only have around 19 million and they're going to generate more and more every year until we hit that 20 million number. So you have those three different market caps. You have market cap based on circulating supply, total supply, and max supply. And I think circulating supply is the most useful. Now it's important to note that market cap does not represent the total amount of money invested in a crypto. You can think about it this way. If there's only two people buying a crypto, let's say I buy one token for $1 and then another person buys the second token for $2. Well, the market cap is going to be calculated based on that $2 they put in. So they're gonna see there's two tokens in existence. The most recent price was $2. So they're gonna say the market cap of the crypto is worth $4 in total, even though I only put in $1 and the next guy put in $2. So yes, the market cap can actually differ from the total amount invested in the crypto. A few other metrics that are important to understand are volume, which is the daily value that is traded in a crypto. And then also we should understand inflation versus deflation in cryptos. So Bitcoin, for example, has a fixed supply, but Dogecoin on the other hand is inflationary, meaning more coins are generated over time. This means that the value over time will decrease at the same rate that the new coins are generated, assuming no new money is put into the ecosystem. So right now, Dogecoin is inflating at around 3.8% per year. And this works just the same way that inflation works in say the US dollar. But in addition to inflationary tokens, there are also deflationary tokens. So for example, Ethereum at times when its gas fees or transaction fees are high enough, actually burns more crypto than new crypto is generated. Or Ethereum 2, for example, may make it deflationary as more tokens end up getting burned than created, 
which theoretically would result in the price of an individual token rising over time. The last concept that we need to talk about in the context of tokenomics is HODLers, which stands for Hold On For Dear Life. Now, HODLers are people who essentially hold their tokens forever, and they act as sort of a base for the entire crypto community because their value is locked into the tokens. The ultimate HODLer is Satoshi Nakamoto, who has 1.1 million Bitcoin, which would be worth around $34 billion if he ever sold it. But they're probably never going to get sold because chances are Satoshi's not alive anymore. Now, there is some debate if these tokens should be counted in the circulating supply since technically they could move at any moment, or if they should be considered as total supply since they do exist, but chances are they're never going to move out of those wallets and interact with the rest of the ecosystem in the future. Quick pause there, I'm offering this video completely for free and I want to get it out to as big of an audience as possible. So if you would please just hit the like button and leave a comment saying anything you've learned up to this point in the video, it really helps with the YouTube algorithm and helps get this video pushed out to a wider audience. I'm not gonna tell you to subscribe because that's up to you if you wanna see content like this in the future. And with that said, let's get back to the video. So next up, we need to talk about NFTs. So first off, what actually is an NFT? Well, the main concept behind NFTs is the idea of digital uniqueness. Basically, an NFT is the ability to sign anything to make it unique online. And this isn't a new concept. For example, you have a Facebook account. That's a unique account that's signed to you, only it's done by Facebook and it's not decentralized. So for example, Jack Dorsey made an NFT of his first tweet on Twitter and he sold it for $2.9 million. But that NFT essentially represents Jack's signature of this tweet. For example, I made a video making an NFT of that exact same tweet, and that NFT represented my signature of the tweet. And if I wanted to, I could issue a million of those signatures if I wanted to. And the fact is, NFTs are not just for art. That's just the use case that's seen the most use from them over the last year or so. For example, another use case for NFT is selling digital real estate in something like Decentraland or the metaverse, where you could own a piece of property in a virtual world. Or you could use NFTs for selling items in video games, only instead of only owning that item in a specific video game, you could use the network to transfer it to other games as well if someone built an adapter there. Basically, an NFT would enable any kind of digital ownership to be transferred from one place to another without any one company having control over it, which is, despite the hype, a really powerful concept. In fact, about a year ago, I listened to a podcast by Three Lau, who's a DJ who sold one of his albums as an NFT for $11.6 million. And on that podcast, which was the Graham Stephan's Iced Coffee Hour podcast, he gave a different perspective on NFTs and how you could use NFTs almost like a ticket for a show. So for example, if 3 Lau issued 10,000 NFTs of his latest album, if you bought one of those NFTs, you could unlock the album ahead of time from a website designed specifically for that, or maybe you could use that NFT as an access code to get into his concerts. So that's really the core idea here. An NFT simply represents digital ownership. That being said, NFTs have been extremely hyped up recently. I told you how Beeple sold his NFT for $69 million. A couple memers have sold theirs for multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. And honestly, there's a lot of sketchy stuff going on here. There are a lot of wash sales, which is an illegal technique where you essentially create one account to sell an NFT. Then you create a second account where you buy the NFT from yourself at several thousand dollars, and then you sell it for 75% off. So it looks like a good deal for everybody else out there. They're getting 75% off, even though you set the original price in the first place by buying it from yourself. And even if there isn't a legal activity going on, a lot of the NFT sales have actually been marketing stunts. So for example, the buyer of Beeple's artwork that initially kicked off the NFT craze with that $69 million purchase did it as a marketing stunt for Metapurse's token. And it worked out. That token called B20 shot up from a $20 million market cap to a $280 million market cap after that purchase. Of course, now that token is basically worthless, which shows that this marketing is very temporary. Now, another term you may have heard thrown around in the crypto space is DAO, or Decentralized Autonomous Organization. A DAO is essentially an implementation of a smart contract used to create some kind of governance for an organization. So you can basically vote on issues by following rules issued in the initial smart contract. 
Now, DAOs in reality are still in very early stages. Most DAOs are really just Discord groups that have separate rules anyway, and the smart contracts on their cores are usually pretty buggy or don't really have much power behind them. And the reason for that is because they're so new. There's no best practices on how to set up a DAO, there's no standard code to build on, and so because of that, there's a lot of bugs and they're pretty brittle at the, at the moment. But we can talk about their potential in the future. So really the potential goal of DAOs is to become decentralized corporations, where they can enforce bylaws just like a corporation would have, only instead of needing people or courts to do it, they can use code to enforce those automatically. Now the drawbacks for this is it's way less flexible than using a court system, but the benefits are it's not tied to any one system's court system or you don't have to make different rules for every country, and it's potentially much more decentralized than a typical corporation. Now that being said, DAOs from an investment perspective, I don't think are super relevant today. A lot of tokens talk about having DAOs, but that's again, more of a marketing thing, and there's not really much power behind them today. So if you see references to DAOs out there on some cryptos page, just understand the limitations to those organizations at this point. Chances are most of the power just comes from a group of individuals agreeing on rules and not from any kind of technical smart contract working behind the scenes. Which leads us into an extremely topic to talk about with cryptos, which are common crypto traps. Specifically, we're gonna start by talking about scams. Now the first scam you need to be aware of are Ponzi schemes, where essentially one coin will promise you a 10% return every day. And they initially deliver on this by going out and getting more people to put money into the token. So the initial group gets their 10% funded by the next group. That group, that's their 10% funded by the next group. And it goes on and on and on until eventually they run out of people to add to it and the whole thing collapses all at once. An example of this was BitConnect, which was a famous scam that ran a couple years ago and a lot of people lost money on it. Another common crypto scam is a rug pool, which is really just a pump and dump. Basically, a creator will hype up a coin a ton, get a lot of people to buy into it, and then they'll sell out all of their tokens and the coin will essentially go to zero. A recent example of this was the Squid Game token, which rose 33,600%, but the developer of the token never created a mechanism for people to sell the token. So essentially, they disappeared overnight, along with the money from 43,000 investors in the token. The next scam are wash trades, which I talked about before, which is essentially where you buy an asset at a higher price with the intention of creating artificial value and then sell it off to someone else who thinks they're getting a good deal, even though there was never any value behind it in the first place. The next scam is phishing, which is a scam that's existed in emails for a very long time, where people try to steal your private key and get access to your wallet. Similarly, there's also link swapping where a legitimate transaction with someone goes through, but then at the last moment, they send you a bad link where when you click on it, they'll steal your key again. The thing is crypto is only secure on the network. The endpoints, which is basically you, are still very vulnerable to attack. And the easiest point to attack on that entire chain is the initial person making a purchase. And the last scam is insider trading. Pretty much any stock manipulation technique that has existed over the years but is now illegal is pretty much running rampant inside the crypto community. So for example, insider trading right now, since cryptos are technically not a security, people can buy and sell on information that's not public. If I was a developer of a coin, I could buy a whole bunch before issuing a new feature which would cause the price to go up. It's honestly the wild west out there right now, so be careful of all these different scams. But outside of actual scams, there are also some traps that result entirely from your own psychology. The first one is price anchoring. Price anchoring is where you buy into a crypto based on what its price has done in the past. So for example, you look at a crypto and you see its price two months ago was twice as high as it is today. So you think, well, the price was high before, maybe it'll go back up again in the future. The problem is, if a crypto is acting as an efficient market, the market shouldn't care about where the price has been in the past. So if you're buying or selling a crypto, all you should care about is will the price go higher in the future or will it go lower? The past price really should not be relevant. The second trap is just falling in love with a given crypto. You can't become blind to the flaws in a given crypto, and you can't get so invested in a given community that you forget the fact that there are flaws in any project. For example, there's a lot of people who rode the Dogecoin hype train straight to the top and then rode it right back down to the bottom again. The next psychological trap is FOMO or fear of missing out. 
This happens when you see a crypto rising in price really quickly and you see everybody else making a ton of money and you just wanna get into it. So you wait and you see it go up a little more, then you wait and you see it go up a little more, then you finally buy into the hype and what do you know, the moment you buy in, the price crashes again because you were the last person sitting on the sidelines who hadn't bought in yet. FOMO falls into the category of emotionally driven decisions and can really cost you in the crypto market. Now on the flip side of that, there's also FUD, which stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Now, it's good to be cautious. In fact, I would say it's better to be overly cautious than to get involved in hype. But at the same time, you shouldn't let fear drive all of your decisions. The question you should be asking yourself is, will this be worth more in five years? Even if the price is dropping today, if you think it will be worth more in the future, it makes sense to hold on to the coin. Don't succumb to fear unless you have a good reason for selling out of the coin. The next potential trap is our good friend Dunning-Kruger. It's a huge factor in crypto that you have to know what you don't know. Yes, you might not know everything about a given crypto. You might not understand all the technical specifications, but at least understand the fact that there's areas you don't know. It's important to keep on learning, but stay humble. It's important to accept new information when it's presented to you. And it's important to never assume you're an expert because the fact is, if you are an expert in a given area, you'll be aware of the limitations of your own knowledge. And then the last common psychological trap is action bias. Now, all humans are inherently biased toward taking action versus not taking action. So let's say you had 100% of your money invested in Bitcoin in 2017 and you saw the price go way down, then you saw it come way back up. Well, if so much of your net worth is tied up in the price of Bitcoin, you'll feel inherently like you need to do work to earn the increasing price. So you might do this by starting to day trade Bitcoin or try to trade in and out of smaller cryptos that you don't know as much about. Sometimes the best thing to do is sit there and do nothing. And you shouldn't let the psychological pressure to feel like you need to be being productive, you need to earn more money, prevent you from actually making money in the long run. So kind of the last major question you need to ask yourself before investing is how much money you should invest into crypto specifically. The fact is cryptos are much riskier than stocks and their volatility is massively higher than pretty much any other asset out there. You could buy a crypto today and it could be worth 10 times as much a year from now or it could be worth 10% of what it is right now. And so your actual age actually plays a factor in how much money you can afford to invest in crypto. Now, it's all based on something called modern portfolio theory, which calculates how much money you should allocate to a given asset based on its volatility and the distance you are from retirement. Originally, it was created for comparing stocks and bonds, but it works just as well for cryptos. Basically, the older you are or the closer you are to needing a given set of money, the less volatile assets you should be investing in. So if you were going to retire five years from now, you'd want most of your money to be in very safe investments that you're confident are still going to be there in five years. But if you're younger and you have say 50 years until you need to touch the money, you can afford to have that money double and then go in half and then double again and then fall in half again and do that multiple times as long as over the next 50 years, it tends to increase in, on average. Now, modern portfolio theory wasn't created with cryptos in mind and cryptos are way more valuable than stocks. But if you're more conservative with this allocation, so basically the older you are, you should put even less into cryptos than you would in stocks, the better off you'll be. Now, the other problem with modern portfolio theory is it actually doesn't account for downside risk. All it cares about is volatility in the stocks and it kind of assumes they'll go up over time. The fact is the whole US stock market is not going to go to zero, but certain crypto projects almost certainly will. Now, you might say that Bitcoin and Ethereum probably aren't going to go to zero and you're probably right. But the fact is the local government that you're under could outlaw it or regulations around say energy use for mining could impact the price or the market could just panic and sell off for a five year period. So I'll tell you what my plan is for allocating crypto. Basically, I'm only going to invest what I can afford to lose. Now, yeah, I know that I'm probably not going to lose everything, but there is a chance that that could happen. So for me, that's really anywhere from a three to 10% allocation is what I would be comfortable losing. Now it's on the higher side right now while I'm young because I have money actively coming in. I'm not planning on needing that money in the near future. I'm not going to retire for quite a long time so I can afford to lose more. But if I were in my 40s or 50s or 60s, that percentage would be much lower for me. So really you need to determine for yourself how much money you can afford to lose and then you should allocate money to cryptos accordingly. And I also think that your crypto allocation should be smaller than the amount you have allocated to stocks. 
But the last topic we need to talk about here are investment taxes. Now, crypto purists are probably freaking out right now because you shouldn't have to pay taxes on something that's not part of the government. But the fact is, in most countries, you're going to be regulated in some way. And in the US, the IRS will come after you. So everything I'm gonna talk about here is from the US perspective, but it's going to have similarities to other countries as well. So first off, anytime you sell your cryptos, that is a taxable event. Or if you transfer, say, Ethereum to a stable coin like USDC, that is also a taxable event. Which means that once you make that transfer in that calendar year, you're going to owe taxes on any gains that you've made. Now there's a couple kinds of ways that this could be taxed. If you held that asset for less than a year, you're going to pay what's known as short-term capital gains taxes, which in the US is just exactly equal to whatever your ordinary income would be from your job. The other option, if you held that asset for over a year, is you will pay long-term capital gains, which can be a tax rate of anywhere from 0% to 15% to 20%. It's 0% if you make less than $40,000 in income, it's 15% up to $445,000, and then it's 20% for any amount above that. Now, in addition to that, any staking rewards you get from crypto is going to be taxed as ordinary income. Now, actually the IRS does not offer any explicit guidance for how they're going to tax staking rewards, but if you wanna be conservative and not have the tax man come after you in a few years, acting as if it's ordinary income is probably the safest option for most people. Now, if you wanna calculate your capital gains, you can use a calculator on NerdWallet, which works pretty well, and you basically just enter how much money you have, how much money you make, and how long you held the asset, and they'll tell you what you'll owe on it. Additionally, if you use one of the exchanges I talked about earlier, like Coinbase, most of them will generate IRS tax documents for you, so that's one benefit to using an exchange. But now, let's talk about some next steps with getting started with investing. The first question you really need to answer for yourself is how much money you can afford to invest in cryptos. Now, if this is the first time you've ever touched cryptos, you're probably gonna wanna start with a much smaller number than the maximum amount you're willing to lose because you need to get used to everything and you don't wanna make a mistake and send all your crypto to a dead wallet and it all disappears forever. Your next step is going to be to start learning about specific crypto projects you're interested in. If you're brand new, Bitcoin or Ethereum might be good options to start because you know they're probably not going to go to zero at any point in the near future. After that, you're going to want to pick either an exchange or a wallet to hold your crypto in. My recommendation would be to probably use both just to get used to them. Just put a little bit of money into a wallet just so you get comfortable with the whole idea of storing your money by yourself and understanding the fact that there's no company backing that. So if you make a mistake and send it to the wrong person, that money is gone forever. It's also good to get some exposure to the exchanges, just to understand how they work, understand what their benefits are, and if you're willing to take the trade-off of having to trust a company versus the benefits that they provide. After that, the last step is to buy a crypto. And depending on what crypto you buy, you may want to stake it. So if it uses proof of stake, like say Polkadot or Solana, that's a good option. And then the last step is to completely forget that you own it. Don't check your account balance every day. Don't even check it every week. I personally would not check my balance any less than once a month unless there's some specific event happening that means that I need to monitor it a little more closely. This will again help you avoid emotionally driven decisions and should help you perform better over the long term. Now as for future sources for more information, you can go back to the sources that I listed for finding information. I haven't read any books specifically on crypto that I thought were any good, but there are a couple books on investing in general that I think will apply to cryptos too. The first is The Black Swan by Nassim Taleb, which deals with markets in general and predicting future events in those markets. And since crypto is a market, it can apply to that pretty well, even though it was written with stocks in mind. The second is Flash Boys by Michael Lewis. Now this book is specifically focused on Wall Street, but it really gives you an inside look at what they're doing over there. And even though Wall Street is bigger in stocks than in crypto right now, I guarantee they have their eyes on crypto and they're going to start having an influence on this market. So I think reading about that could be a good opportunity to understand some of the effects that they may have on the crypto market going forward. But leave a comment on what you learned from this video or if you have any specific questions on investing in cryptos. Also be careful of scammers in the comments. I guarantee there's going to be some down there and they're probably gonna to try to get you to text them on WhatsApp or whatever, so don't do that. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.